You're listening to Olivia's Book Club, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Olivia's Book Club. And I'm your host, Olivia Fierro, and feeling extra special slash sentimental, which is perfect for our theme today, because this is the last episode of this particular podcast, at least in this incarnation. So thank you so much for listening. Thanks for being with me. Thanks for all of the book recommendations, author recommendations, and huge thanks to the authors who have joined me over these 105 episodes as of today. So this grand finale episode is perfect for my very special guest who is returning to the show. He is the author of... so many, so many good books, including Lily and the Octopus, the editor, and the Gunkle, which our book club read as a group, and we're able to talk with him about it um, from home, Zooming, really in the middle of uh, COVID pandemic restrictions. So that was a really special uh, escape mentally for all of us and emotionally. So Stephen Rowley, thank you so much for joining me today. The celebrance is absolutely fantastic. I'm sure it is being celebrated everywhere you go. And I mean, you just are everywhere from Times Square billboards to all of the national programs and on and on. And this book truly deserves it. So congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. First, it's a joy to be back. I didn't realize that I am anchoring the final episode of this podcast. I was like, no, 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 we got to get you somebody else. But I'll, <laughs> I'll do my best to put an exclamation point on the end of it. We'll what tie a, it up a in run. a bow. We'll what tie a it in a bow. Uh, um, but I'm just going to pat myself on the back for one second and having the foresight to write a book around the theme of celebration when so many wonderful things have been happening for it. Uh, who knew? Who could have known? It's incredible. So, okay, I, I immediately, when I was reading this book, ordered a copy and sent it to a girlfriend of mine. So I'm going to do an indulgent little shout out to a couple friends of mine from college. The first people I met in our dorm, Leanne was the first one, and it was Lauren and Liz. And Tiffany. And this little crew was very, very tight. Um, Most of us still get together very frequently. Uh, We played a game called Funeral Game, and it was a morbid fascination um, after drinking uh, Boone's Farm wine, I believe it was, that $4 stuff. And uh, (laughs) we we had a lot of odd habits. We would sometimes play the game of life. We would drink this wine. We would go up on the rooftop of our dormitory because it was a little dangerous. And we would, we would, fantasize about what it would be like if we had to have a funeral for one of us and who would come and who would be authentic about their grief and who would be who would be faking it oh completely who would be trying to like be the attention hog and all of it so I just she doesn't read a lot of fiction I hope she does read it but I said Leanne you have to you have to read this book because it's like this little piece of weird weirdness that we have and it turned out to be the most beautiful story so what was your origination for this story? Yeah, well, people have asked me, you know, do I have a group of college friends like in the book itself? And I have, you know, I joke, not anymore, not after <laughs> writing this one, um, because God help you if you are related to or friends with writers, we can we can be sponges. Um, but no, they, they need not worry. The, the characters in this are, are wholly original. So um, just to, to give the quick elevator pitch, you know, the, uh, the book is about a group of college friends from the class of 1995 who lose one of their own to, to suicide right before graduation. And after attending his very real funeral um, and hearing the incredible things that were said about him, uh, are left to wonder if he might have made a different choice if he'd been able to, to hear all that. Um, and so they make a pact in that moment right before they scatter to the wind, you know, after graduating, um, that they will reassemble uh, at each friends low point in life and they will throw their funeral while they're still alive to to hear that and they will sort of force them to sit through their own eulogies and and hopefully through that process remind them how much they're loved how remind them how much they're needed here and 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 perhaps reignite um some passion for for living uh and so i don't think any of them think they're going to need this pack but you know over the decades life <laughs> intervenes life intervenes um I was inspired early on in the pandemic, you know, like many of us, we were turning to Netflix or Hulu and looking for, I was looking for movies that I might find uh, comforting, um, that I might've had a passing familiarity with, but didn't really know all that well. And I stumbled on The Big Chill, Mm -hmm. which is a movie um, from the early eighties about a group of college friends who who sort of reunite um, 
after the death of one of their own. And, and you know, they're contemplating their lives in middle age and, and what uh, the back half of their lives are going to look like. And all the characters in that film were 35 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and as someone who was facing their 50th birthday, I thought, well, this isn't comforting. You know, this isn't comforting <laughs> to me at all. So, but it was, you know, striking to me how we've changed our thoughts about middle age and, and, the, these middle years in life and um, and how we think about aging. And so, you know, that was kind of the jumping off point. The, the title, The Big Chill itself, sort of referred to that time when you were married, you had kids, you owned a house, which is something people used to be able to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, and you maybe worked for one company and, and, and kept that job through collecting a pension and retirement. And, and now I was struck by how different um, things are, you know, we were apt to have uh, maybe more than one marriage or a blended family, or certainly we reinvent ourselves and mm -hmm. have the ability to have, have multiple jobs and careers sometimes. And so I thought this is the real fertile ground for where there's so much story now. There's so much story in these middle in these middle years. Well, and it's so true because who we were at that time, I mean, in the 90s, you are looking ahead to a future that is just so different than the way people's mm -hmm. lives have played out. I mean, I was thinking about even in college, just the big changes from now to then is, I mean, we didn't use the internet. I don't think we had the internet. No, so like we had to go to the library. <laughs> In fact, these characters don't reunite, reunite until uh, at least 15 years after, I'm, I'm forgetting the timeline offhand, yeah. but after college, but you know, I had to explain to someone, you know, a younger reader the other day, I was like, you don't understand, you know, when we graduated in the mid nineties, there was no email, there right. was no cell phone, there like, was bye. no social media. Mm -hmm. It was very easy to lose track mm -hmm. of people. Um, and so, uh, you know, the characters in this book, it takes them a little while to, to, to find each other again. Right, because you really have to call somebody up or uh, they're, yeah, they're on a landline. <laughs> and <laughs> hope they didn't move. Good God. <laughs> so How intrusive. Can yeah. you imagine? That's not the way to rekindle a friendship is calling somebody on their landline. On the landline, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want it. Uh, yeah. But, you know, just, just, just have, I mean, it is, it's just so relatable and, and you have such a tremendous gift. And we, by the way, I mentioned that we had book club uh, here, The Gunkle, mm -hmm. and you were mm -hmm. so sweet to join us for our conversation d uh, of the book. And it was so special because we were really just feeling like that cooped up sense. And it was, this was just, that was such a delightful, perfect book for the moment that we were in because it was so much humor and so much heart. And it did create a sense of connection between you and the reader and the characters and, and, and all of us together. So really appreciated that. And this does this as well. You are so funny and you are able to make moments and relationships that are so warm and real real um, and painful, just so trickled in with humor that it, it, it just is, there's so much authenticity on the page and it's just a tremendous gift. And I absolutely loved this book and all of the weird, this weird group of friends <laughs> so, oh, so much. I love it. Well, I mean, uh, you think about what do you do when you get together with your friends, right? Well, drink, but after that, <laughs> like, hopefully, hopefully you laugh. Too. Yes. And uh -huh. so that is, um, you know, that that's the real joy in writing a book like this. Also the, the, the challenge too, because not only are you creating each individual character, you have to write the friendship and what that feels like. And hopefully after decades, you know, it feels lived in and time worn. Um, and and over the decades, you know, there can be resentments between some of them. There could be crushes, you know, <laughs> that come and go. There could be, you know, certainly there's inside jokes that mm -hmm. they have, but you want to write them in a way that doesn't exclude the reader. Um, you know, because I really want the reader to feel like they're a member of this, this friend group too. Well, and I think when we get back together with groups of friends or, or groups of people, whether it's family or friends from different parts of our lives, those dynamics immediately sort of return. So maybe, you know, you were you were the one who kind of was like, okay, go along with whatever. And this is the one who always dominates the conversation or makes the decisions or whatever. And, and in your personal life or in your relationships with other people, you've changed or evolved or, or fixed something that bugged you. We slide right back into old dynamics when we're with people who we had that long history from with. And the, the intimacy of being new on campus in dorms, in particular mm -hmm. your characters as transfer students. So they have kind of a smaller pool of people to really click with in that in that real way of having the similar the same experience. It's just 
it's so it's so well developed and i mean they were just uh they they who who did you begin with i assume it was with the jordans yeah so um th that's also interesting now because i'm thinking about college friends in particular you know you may be friends be uh, because of the whim of a certain housing office uh -huh. you know <laughs> algorithm yep. that put you on the same dormitory floor, right? Um, and so these are very diverse and, and hopefully interesting uh, people. And I, I've had a few readers at first, though, I didn't understand why they were friends. Uh, and I said, well, sometimes that's the way it is in uh -huh. college. Oh, you yeah. know, it's random. And then and then you have history in common. And then you have the experience of college in common. And then and then you're kind of off to the races, um, you know, with these, these longstanding friendships. Um, I think I did start with the Jordan. So not only do I have this group of friends and and it's hard, you know, as a reader and, and as a viewer of movies and TV, I always love those big scenes, big scenes, lots of characters, like a, a big family Thanksgiving dinner scene or something, you know, where there's a potential for drama. They're really hard to write. <laughs> and somehow I created a large friend group and they all hang out together, you know, in the in the book. And I named two of them the same name. <laughs> I must have lost my mind. I must have lost my mind. Yeah, the Jordans. There's two characters named Jordan. Um, I, I think they were they were a jumping off point. But yeah, I think they're um, some of them are inspired or comp the pieces of my actual college friends. But like every character I write, you know, each one has a little piece of me in them yeah. in them too. And I think of, you know, I think of Naomi who who might lash out mm -hmm. at, at your insecurities with like with a barb or a joke, uh, but it's because you know she's afraid of someone discovering her own insecurities and getting there first. And so, um, you know, a character like that could be lots of fun too. Ultimately, I think the hardest character to figure out was was Alec, was the one that was lost, you know, mm -hmm. the, the sixth member of the group um, that passed away right before graduation. Mm -hmm. And it was so important for me to understand that character, I think, as the glue that keeps these friends reuniting decade after decade mm -hmm. after decade. So there's it's so hard when you're when to to be a young person and to lose somebody who matters to you and, and not somebody who I mean at any point loss and, and, and grief is, is difficult but you know if it's a, a an elderly grandparent or something that makes sense in the world order when you're trying mm -hmm. to kind of compartmentalize and understand you know where you're safe and, and and what you need to be worried about and and what makes sense um you know everything shifts when it's somebody young and when it's somebody who has so much life left to live and it really really is such a, a a grounding point for all of them and it and it and I do believe it's so accurately portrayed in this that it makes you reevaluate everything and it gives them at a young age whether they follow through with it immediately or not um, plants the seeds of that of a depth of sensitivity and accountability to the other humans in their lives that they really love and they want yeah, to Yeah, I love value. that you mentioned an, a world order because it, it's so true. It doesn't make losing a parent or a grandparent easy, right. um, certainly ever, but we expect perhaps to deal with that right. um, at some point in our lives. It's the same thing that makes losing a child for a parent, you know, like that's very much out of the world order. That should not happen. And when it does, it's, it's supremely tragic. Um, but the deal with friends, you know, the, you know, particularly where I am, you know, right now in my 50s, I have friends who are 25 years older. I have friends who are 25 years younger. There's no real order for, for, for friends. And it does, you're right, when you lose a contemporary, a close contemporary for the first time, it can make you question your own mortality mm -hmm. uh, in a way that you may not have uh, before, particularly when you're young. And I think there is a certain amount of trauma bonding for these characters, you know, having lost someone very young um, that keep them sort of invested in each other, even when you have a character like Craig, who I think um, is the one character who's like, why, why, why do we keep doing this? Why are we friends? Why, why don't we just let this rest? You know, uh, but there is something um, important, I think. And I, again, I hope it underscores the, um, um, you know, inspire it underscores the, the need to be sort of uh, inspired and embrace actually living because our time here is limited exactly and, and and communicating to other people 
what they what they mean to us. And it is true. It is tragic to think about letting people light up your life and, and thinking about how funny and special they are, uh, what they mean to you, what comfort they gave you at a critical time or whatever, and having all of that go unsaid. And I think in our romantic relationships, certainly we express mm-hmm. ourselves, uh, maybe in familial relationships, but there's a lot of friend dynamics who are super tight friends who probably don't say those words. Like don't say, I love you, or I couldn't have gotten yeah. through this time without yeah. you. Because it's just, and it's harder to put that in. Them when problems in our other relationships oh, yeah. we're the first one to turn to our friends but yet we don't you know we don't express what those friends always mean to us uh in the same way i will say um you know the theme of telling people what they mean to you um while they're here to hear it um there's going to be a lot of talk between artists and writers i think in particular about how we reflect on the past few years mm-hmm. um that we've been through right and i have very conveniently skipped the years 2019 to 2023 <laughs> in this book because that's my book my yeah. prerogative and you get i don't to feel do like that. going back there mm-hmm. um however um that that sense of uh, of um of wanting people to know, you know, because we have lost a lot. We've lost a lot in the in the past few years. And if it's not, a, you know, a person in your life, although we have lost a lot of people, um, we've certainly lost time, mm-hmm. right? And we've lost the ability to be together um, for a few years. And so, so that idea of of really not waiting and 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 using the moment, you know, the urgency of right now to tell these people. Um, in your life, what they mean. I, I think it's absolutely a reaction to the past few years. Oh, no doubt about it. And I think pe- a lot of people are embracing transitions right now in, in various parts of their lives because of that, whether it's conscious or subconscious, because you're sort of realizing like, the time. time We lost some time. Uh, nothing is guaranteed to us. Mm-hmm. And we want to uh, feel as fulfilled or as, as vibrant and vital as we can while we can. Uh, because yeah. we've 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 all at least collectively experienced like a powerlessness right. that was And I love that though that something good can come out yeah. of this, you know, the past few years. And you're absolutely right and that people are embracing new things and new ch- the time to wait to f- follow that dream mm-hmm. is, you know, it's not an uncertain future. It's, you know, the time the time is now and we've had some shifts where people have a little more flexibility and working mm-hmm. from home. You know, there th- th- things, you know, work life balance, you know, the things we think about after the past few years. There there definitely been some benefits as well. Not to give anything away, uh, but there are a couple of like celebration type of experiences uh, that are, are, are part of, of this story and, and some of the various get togethers over the years. Um, one being, um, well, we've got some great tequila consumption, which we love. <laughs> That's key. Uh, we also yeah. have um, skydiving. So of these activities, which are you uh, open to? Oh my goodness. These days I keep my feet on the ground and drink tequila, right? If it's going to feel like I'm falling through the air, it's because I've the spins that come after drinking too much tequila, right? I'm not going 30,000 feet in the air. Uh, the, <laughs> I will say this, if you have aspirations to go skydiving, do it before you read the celebrants. Um, and again, the, the, these are celebrations of life, right? These yeah. are funerals. Mm-hmm. They're living funerals. Mm-hmm. So people, I don't want to think there's a high body count in this book. <laughs> no, um, no. But it is funny. And I do think it's among the funniest scenes I've oh, ever written. But so I have funny. been skydiving once. I, I don't feel, I'm so glad I did it. Yeah. It's an incredible experience. Um, I probably at my age not going to do it again, but we'll, you know, we'll see. So tequila for me. Put me in the tequila call. Yeah. You don't need to be one of those people who you see will run the news stories and it's like, you know, Judy is 103 and she goes skydiving yeah, goes every skydiving. year on her birthday. Yeah. Oh, Judy. <laughs> Judy. Judy, 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 Judy. You're Judy, always Judy. showing off. We just... could have just fixed you a Paloma here on the ground. <laughs> there we go. Save yourself <laughs> some money and some stress. That's so Judy, though. It, yeah. it is. Every, everybody knows her. <laughs> um, I, I don't know the timeline, but I do want to extra congratulate you because you're you're fairly recently married is that Mm -hmm. yes Mm -hmm. yes two years oh my gosh so during this this time you've had you've had like a great couple of years i mean the world be damned yeah i you know there's another shoe and i'm sort of waiting for it to drop (laughs) i hope not you know i'm just start carrying an umbrella because I'm, i'm terrified of it falling on me 
Um, yeah, it's and not only that, I'm married to another writer uh, who also had a book this summer, on the same day, big as the gay wedding, right? Big gay wedding, yeah. So Byron, were you Byron Lane, my husband. Byron Lane, and you were you two book touring together? Have you been kind of overlapping in this experience a little bit? We were a little bit, That's yeah. Cool. Um, we have done a bunch of events together. We've done a few on our own. We've been crisscrossing. We met together in New York yesterday. I was like, oh, you, I remember you. Remember that? <laughs> hey. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been a real joy. Um, I think, uh, people want to know if we, if we orchestrated this and the, mm -hmm. the answer is of course, yeah, no, no, <laughs> there's no, there's no way we could, you know, we have different publishers and different mm -hmm. agents and different careers. And we wrote the books at slightly different times, mm -hmm. but, um, it's the way the stars aligned. And I think we chose to see it as, as opportunity. And Absolutely. It's been great fun to do a few of these events together, though. It's been like free marriage counseling. You know, if you get up in front of a group of strangers and they start asking you questions about how your relationship works and the writing and do you write together or separately and, you know, you're for, forced to be honest in a way. I've learned, we've learned a few things about each other. Right. Well, I, I took a, a glance at his bio too. And, and now I've, I've got mm. his book on my, on my TBR list, which is just mm. so, so outrageous. But, um, so he had a, a cancer battle. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So obviously there are notes of, of, of the the emotional journey that that requires. Sure, here in sure, this. yeah. In the celebrants, you know, the pact it sort of starts to spin a little bit out of control, right? So somebody gets a destination funeral, somebody else gets <laughs> the surprise <laughs> funeral, you know. Uh, but there is something in the book that happens that underscores uh, the seriousness of the pact and sort of leads them back to the original intentions, um, and that is. Um, yeah, you know, as writers, we write to understand sometimes, you know, what, what we have been through. And Byron had some health challenges, and I'm happy to say that he's he's fine now. But um, it was a really scary moment, particularly, and this was in 2020, mm. um, where he was undergoing chemotherapy yeah. and, and against the backdrop of, of, you know, the very early, early days of the pandemic when we were still washing our groceries, mm -hmm. you know, or leaving the mail in the sun before bringing it in and all this uncertainty. And then to have someone who's so immunocompromised, to, you know, in, against, you know, the backdrop of a raging pandemic, that was a, a very scary time. Um, and um, I'm happy to say it all, it all worked out. But um, I think, you know, there are notes from that, that definitely both inspired uh, the book or, or made their way into the book, but also inspired our getting married. Um, and I will say for, you know, for, for gay people, a marriage equality became the law of the land in 2015. We'd been together a few years at that time, but it didn't mean that we automatically wanted to. Man. When something's mm -hmm. not available to you for a long time, you know, I didn't, I didn't ever take the time to think about what the institution of marriage meant, meant to me personally. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was really um, the challenges of, of that year for us that, that solidified my feelings about the importance of being able to protect him and and mm -hmm. um, protect ourselves and our relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to be be there for your person when um, when things are are, are are scary and in in all the ways. I mean, the, the legal ways and just ev everything. Um, in so every way. Although I will say, I think you know, in because it was twenty twenty, I was not allowed in when he was receiving uh, his treatment. Mm -hmm. I was not allowed in the in the hospital. But in retrospect, that was probably a blessing because I would have fussed over him in a way that would have <laughs> annoyed. Been a little him disruptive. No <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure you were there to pro try to provide some levity uh, at home, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> I, that's what we do. That's what we do. Um, you know, he's a very funny writer as well. So I, I will say one of the one of the things I love most about our relationship is we laugh every day. So that's amazing. Yeah. And that, that you, you can't come home to a, a, a serious house uh, uh, that would that would just be a drag. There would be nothing to celebrate yeah. there. Yeah. Um, I noticed that you did do finally a playlist for this book yeah right? every single character in the book has their own spotify playlist oh, of every 90s single hits. character oh yeah whoa. so i want yeah check them out i would love to know which character you uh identify with most based on their musical taste oh that's uh, so cool but it is that was fun too because the other thing that people remember about the big chill is it had that Music. incredible mm -hmm. soundtrack um, for that, you know, that was a, a baby boomer generation. So they were sort of Motown, you know, 60s hits. And this is all very much music from the first half of the 1990s. Uh, so that's my ready. jam. You get your 90 dan 90s dance party on. <laughs> uh, but you can search for them on Spotify. They're on my Instagram and my highlighted stories are links to each uh, 
playlist. So I just I hope people listen to them because they were co- a lot of fun to assemble. Oh, that is so great. I uh, sometimes uh, default to on Sirius, the first wave station. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I just, and once I put it on, I, I have to force myself to turn it off because it's such a comfort space for me. And that I'll like never be introduced to new music again if I just keep listening to this. So then finally, my husband told me that he doesn't enjoy that station at all. And it was like, what we've been you know together like 17 years or something and i'm like (laughs) what are you talking about he's like i've never liked that music like oh my god you don't like it i mentioned all these concerts that we've gone to together he's like no (laughs) so that was like really (laughs) wow (laughs) so you know the the early 90s music has a very strong spot in my heart whether whether i have the support i need or not yeah mine too too. uh last thing you just had i've enjoyed your social media so much because of your, the book has just been everywhere. So uh, I assume maybe the Times Square gigantic shiny sign the was Jumbotron, a pinch me. My goodness, I had no idea. I had no idea until my publisher sent me that that photo. Um, I think it was part of a Pride Month campaign, um, but it was truly. Um, I don't know. I lived in New York for a few years in the '90s. Uh, <laughs> And my office was in Times Square. And so, um, I don't know, I was just profoundly moved by that uh, experience because it does seem, listen, you know, if you have um, writers listening, you know, who, who listen to this podcast, you know, I, w- I was always jealous of people who came out of a prestigious program, you know, the Iowa Writers Workshop or something and made a headline making deal at 25 for their first novel and were off to the races. That was not my path. I published my first novel when I was 45 years old. And there was a lot of time when I thought it might not happen for me. And so to look back um, now and see see the, it up on the Jumbotron and big lights in Times Square, um, a place where I used to go to dream, you know, it really truly was a magical uh, moment that I won't ever forget. Ah, oh, fantastic. And it really so well deserved. And uh, you also have just every single book basically in a deal to go to the screen somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like you know, all of us talking to you uh, today as a novelist, I am also a proud member of the WGA yes. though. And as, as we such, are on strike, on strike mm-hmm. at the moment, and I will just put in my little spiel. I hope that studios come back to the table mm-hmm. soon pay writers what they're worth if you think about also these past few years what is the first thing we all turn to you know books and mm-hmm. movies and tv to get us through and those you know those come you know the genesis for all of those are with writers and so um i hope that we can uh get an agreement to pay them what they're worth mm-hmm. uh that said um i think the gunkle movie is probably the closest to happening oh, really? and so if we can resolve this strike um then um then yeah and uh we haven't really announced it yet but i think the celebrants will be my first tv series i'll play the tv series based on the celebrants so let's let's get the strike resolved and then we can get this stuff to the screen oh my goodness and i just i picture the gunkle just taking over all of palm springs and production being everywhere and you being probably you know even more of like you know, Mr. Popular in town then. then Wouldn't then that now. be something? <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Fingers crossed. Oh, well, Stephen Rowley, it is a pleasure uh, to speak to you. This book is fantastic. It is going to make you laugh and feel all the feels. And it's just a, a great story. And um, cannot wait to always uh, be supporting your work and looking for the, the next thing I to I appreciate it. And I wish you the very best of luck with the new iteration of whatever might come next. Thank and, you. And uh, it's really an honor to be in the anchor uh, chair for this final episode today. Oh. So It was my pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. You can send us an email with your thoughts or your book recommendations. Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com is the address. And you can check out Olivia's Book Club on Facebook or find us on Instagram. Hello, bookstagrammers, at olivias.bookclub. And Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music. This is Olivia's Book Club, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast.